Well, it's a, um, it's a wonder to be here with you. <laughs> I was going to say it was a pleasure. It's actually a little scary. <laughs> it's a wonder to be here. It's, uh, the, um, I love what I'm hearing. I love what I'm seeing. I, I just, uh, Chris, I'm so impressed with uh, the ministry. Uh, it's, um, it's humbling to stand in front of you and pretend to know something to tell you. Um, but I'm a Bible teacher, and I, I, I just teach the Bible. <laughs> try, to, try to do that. And so I hope that what I have to share with you tonight will be a blessing to you and that it will uh, open scriptures in a different way and uh, be of, of use to you as you go about the incredible work of making disciples in your city. It's, man, when I get in these meetings with Chris and the gang, it's like, wow, <laughs> the stuff that's going on in churches, uh, in communities in our area, it's just you, you wouldn't necessarily know it, but it sure is impressive. And uh, I like God's people. I like what they do. Um, and uh, sure like what I'm hearing from you. So making disciples and developing leaders, I want to talk from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 through 28. You hear all kinds of stuff normally in discipleship, training. Um, I'm coming at it from a different angle today, and we'll see if it works. I, uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in Demopolis, Alabama, on the Tom Bigby River. And um, my parents loved, there was a restaurant that they loved to take us to because it was all-you-can-eat catfish. It was this beautiful place down on the river, and it was all-you-can-eat fried catfish. And uh, I'll never forget this place because once when I was about five or six years old, I, I kicked my shoes off under the table, and uh, we got about 20 minutes from the restaurant, and Daddy had to turn around and go back and get my shoes. It seemed like forever to me when, at that age, you know. <laughs> felt like I'd put them to great inconvenience. It couldn't have taken more than 15 minutes or so to go back and get the shoes. But the place is etched in my memory forever, this place where my family used to love to go and have these sumptuous meals of fried catfish and hush puppies and southern vegetables. And it was, this, it was right there. That's it right there. Ezel's Fish Camp. That's it right there. And uh, Ezel's fish camp was in the new, and that's exactly, that is exactly what it looked like when I was a kid. Exactly. As a matter of fact, they may have remodeled. <laughs> but on that muddy Tom Bigby River, and they'd pull those catfish up out of that muddy water and, and fry them up, and we'd eat as many of them as we could. And here's the thing about Ezel's fish camp. You are never going to go there unless somebody takes you there. <laughs> well, you're never going to drive by that and go, man, I bet they've got good food in there. As a matter of fact, somebody might even take you there and you might conclude that they you really didn't, wasn't, you know, what you were hoping for. <laughs> it's just, it's a humble place. It's, it's not, it's not particularly appealing to, to, to you know, the eyes, uh, um, and honestly, I don't know if the food was any good or not. I just know my parents loved it, and we didn't know any better. So it was, that was it right there. And it, it, as, as I saw this in the newspaper from Butler, Alabama yesterday, uh, my sister sent it to me, um, remembering old times, um, I thought that Christian discipleship is a lot like Ezel's catfish uh, you know, camp because unless somebody takes you there, you're probably not going. Um, you're not going to accidentally become a Christian disciple. It just isn't going to happen. It's not the way it works. Now, it's quite possible that you could find Christ all by yourself and that you could go through some miraculous school of discipleship with Jesus alone. It's possible. I just, have you ever heard of it? It's not real likely. Discipleship is something people have to lead you to. You become a disciple because someone took you along. I mean, when I was in campus ministry, uh, I spent three years as a chaplain at Princeton University. Uh, the model of discipleship we were taught were, um, you go with me, I do, you watch. And then I do, you help. And then you do and I help. And then you do and then I watch. And then you do and take somebody with you. <laughs> because I can't follow you forever. Um, 
That was the model of discipleship. It was always about taking somebody with you in your Christian activities and um, teaching them to do what you've been taught to do. And this is the 2 Timothy 2.2 2 way. <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to give to faithful people what's been imparted to you. It's, and so discipleship is something you've got to lead other people into, and you've got to walk with them. Uh, they're not just going to walk with Jesus alone. And uh, I, I think I, I, it, it's priceless, the discipleship that my own parents gave me as I was growing up. You know, my, my dad especially took a real interest in teaching me to walk with Jesus. And uh, he'd take me places and all the way there and all the way back, we'd talk about, uh, about the Lord. And talk about, I mean, he would take me to go door to door uh, passing out tracts when we were little. He would go from house to house just passing out tracts anybody had taken them. Remember one, uh, I was, remember being five or six years old and uh, these people um, you know, yelled at us at their, and wouldn't, wouldn't take the tracts. And, uh, well, they took them, but they threw them back at us. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but Daddy told me, well, you just shake off the dust of your feet and move to the next place. <laughs> we don't do a lot of that anymore, do we? Um, but Dad took me to the prisons and taught me to minister to prisoners because he, he loved to go and, and, and minister at the county jail, for example. He took me sometimes to prison, sometimes just the county jail, but taught me as a child to uh, give my testimony to prisoners. And I remember sometimes when the Prisoners would just weep over this small child that uh, loved God and cared about them. And they'd think about their own children, you know, who's, where my, where's my kid? Here I am in, the, in jail, where's my kid? Who's teaching my kid to do something like this? It, um, it, it's priceless. I mean, I go on talking about my dad forever and how my dad discipled me. I wouldn't know very much about Christian life if dad hadn't taught me. And, and honestly, this is the way it's supposed to be in families. Parents are supposed to teach their children the faith. I mean, if we, if we um, outsource the Christian training of our children to somebody else, to the church, we're not going to like the product we get back. It just, it's not going to be the same. It's just not going to be the same because we're going to have lost out on so much. Um, but it's, it's crucial if, if we're going to disciple people, we're just going to have to spend time with them. Now, moving into the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 28 is, um, I originally, when Chris talked to me, I thought he was asking me to teach on this passage. It turned out he wasn't intending for me to teach on this passage, but I was vapor locked on it. So <laughs> when I realized that you wanted me to speak about making disciples, I stayed with the passage because... <laughs> I thought that's what the passage is about. Listen to this. Hebrews 10, 22 through 28, the word of God for us. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As I reread this scripture, I thought about the fact that the author of Hebrews is providing discipleship training to his audience. He is calling them to walk with Christ despite the fact that they are living under deep threat of persecution. Uh, they, may be they may be faced with the choice to serve Jesus or die. He wants them not to shrink back, but to press on. And in this particular chapter, he gives them some discipling destruction, uh, instructions that are, are very uh, important. They really teach us three, if not four, crucial elements of disciple making as the passage goes on. The first one is Teaching disciples to pray. Now, I know Scott Dudley spoke on prayer just a few minutes ago, and he's my, one of my favorite preachers in the world. I am a Scott Dudley fan from the get-go. I, I love hearing this man open the Word of God and, 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 and apply it to the world. 
He is a brilliant preacher. I don't want to say too much more about prayer after he has already talked about prayer. But we, we have to teach our disciples to pray. We just have to do that. Uh, this, this, month at, this past month at Northwest University was our 21-day prayer emphasis. And for 21 days, we were just tattooing this concept of prayer, but not just teaching about it in chapel. We had created a, uh, a daily prayer devotional to teach them in prayer. We're teaching different elements about prayer each day in this prayer devotional. We were having special prayer meetings all through this 21-day period. There were times of fasting. There were times of corporate prayer together. The pursuit meetings, which is, if you've never been, let me just say, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm from the Assemblies of God. I am a Pentecostal from the old school. Now, not everybody here is Pentecostal. That's great. That's fine. But if you ever want to go to the most Pentecostal prayer meeting in the Pacific Northwest, or if you've never been to one and you want to go to one, <laughs> you want to show up at Northwest University on Monday nights at 830 because it is a, it is a high octane prayer meeting and uh, it's, it's phenomenal. But really we, we were focusing during that 21 day period on the pursuit meetings being a place where there was intense corporate prayer going on. And I got to, I got to preach one of the sessions in chapel about praying without ceasing. And I told the students about something that, that I do periodically and, and I'm currently in the process of doing. And that is I'll set my cell phone to, to, to alarm every, on the 59th minute of every hour. And, you know, I have this nice little song, very soft song uh, that, uh, to alarm each time. So, but every 59th minute, the cell phone goes off. And, and I stop at that 59th minute and I spend at least one minute giving thanks uh, engaging in some kind of prayer, some form of prayer, whether it's just giving thanks, whether it's just recognizing God's presence with me, uh, whether it's listening to God's uh, voice or interceding for my friends. And then I've got several friends who are in trouble right now that need, need God's healing. So I'm praying for them every hour on the hour and I'm, I'm telling them, I'm praying for you every hour on the hour until you get through this. And it's a, I can't tell you what a blessing it has been to me but I'm encouraging our students to develop this habit of thinking about the Lord all day long. Amen. Thinking about the Lord in, in time and out of time, you know, when, when, it, when it's convenient, when it's not convenient. And, you know, I tell you, when you first start doing the, the, the little uh, alarm emphasis, it's, it's like sometimes it's like, oh, man, <laughs> hit that button and stop it. But after a little while, it, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then, and then. It's funny, I have this little song about prayer that comes up on the, on the alarm. I keep, I keep finding myself at about the 57th minute of the hour, the song will come to my head before the alarm goes off. And, um, and you think about the Lord, and then you know, occasionally you, 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 you forgot to re reset that hour because you've got to reset them every day, and maybe that hour didn't reset, and your mind goes to it without the alarm going to it because you're you're like Pavlov's dog. You've just, <laughs> you know. So I'm doing this for 66 days because 66 is supposed to build a habit. But just to build that habit of returning to God in prayer, we need to be teaching prayer to our, to our disciples, teaching them all the different forms of prayer. I mean, I, I'm having a prayer revival in my life right now. I can't believe how much I am enjoying my prayer life. I've never said this in the, my whole life. I'm 59 years old and I've never said these words. I can't believe how much I'm enjoying my prayer life. But that's what's happening right now. And uh, it's like I can't wait to wake up in the morning because the first thing now is that, that, that returning of the mind to God and that time of prayer first thing in the morning. In the evening, I've started praying the, uh, the um, Ignatian examine every night. Uh, just going back through the day about, you know, what, what happened? How did I feel about it? What's the Lord saying to me? Um, repenting of my sins, giving thanks for what's going on. And, and I can't stop talking about prayer to the people I know. And, and people come to my office for a meeting and off goes the alarm at the 59th minute, which is really good because I should not be having a meeting that goes past the 59th minute. <laughs> it's a great opportunity to end the meeting with prayer. <laughs> but, um, you know, the truth is, if we're not teaching our disciples to pray, we're hurting them. People need to be taught to pray. People don't know what to do. They don't know. They don't know how to pray. They don't know 
what kind of, they don't know how to vary it. They don't know, I mean, they've only been taught one thing. But Jesus, here's the, here's the killer. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. <laughs> if we're going to disciple people like Jesus, and there's really no other way to bother doing it, we're going to teach our disciples to pray. Teach them to pray as Jesus did, with reverence for God, seeking God's kingdom first in our prayers, discerning God's will, offering supplication for our needs, forgiving others and ourselves, um, deliverance from temptation and evil. Jesus taught his disciples to do all those things, but he taught us to do other things. I, I found a little thing in the new, in the, on the internet accidentally. It was in the, the Tallahassee Democrat, which I was really glad that the Tallahassee Democrat is teaching people to pray. But the, Dr. Rosalind Tompkins, she, she laid out the different types of prayer. She says there's communion. That's when you pray with God all day long. There's supplication. That's when you're lifting up your needs to God. Scripture loves that. Scripture wants us. God teaches us that God wants us to bring our request to him. He's not offended at all by us asking him for things. People, so people sometimes ask me for money and they apologize. I say, don't apologize to me. I ask for money all day long every day. <laughs> I respect people that ask for money. Well, Jesus is a prayer warrior. Do you know that? Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the saints all the time. And, uh, you know, he's used to praying. He's used to asking for things. He doesn't mind it at all when we do. As a matter of fact, he kind of respects us when we do. We're, we're, we're never more like Jesus than when we're asking the Father for things. She, said, she mentions intercession. That's praying on behalf of others. It's so crucial that we teach our disciples to do that. Um, spiritual warfare. She mentions, uh, Dr. Tompkins mentions two kinds. There's that spiritual warfare that's dealing with yourself. Um, and, and, you know, that's spiritual warfare at the level of your mind and your thoughts. But then there's that spiritual warfare where you are, where you are struggling with the powers of evil. And you know, if, ne if you don't ever struggle with the powers of evil in your ministry and your prayer life, it may be you're not affecting them much. Because, uh, you know, if they're getting hurt, they're striking back. But we need to teach our disciples to, 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 to do spiritual warfare. And I think we could overdo that. And a lot of, a lot of stuff's been made up about that. You know, Scripture doesn't really say that much about it. But it does talk about it. <laughs> so whatever it is, we need to be doing it. There's prayers of agreement where we come together with others and pray to agree. In corporate prayer, there's watching and praying when you're in a constant state of awareness when trouble is, is present and, and you need to be attentive to God because you're desperate for Him and you really need His help. There's prayers of thanksgiving in which we count our blessings and name them one by one. All of these forms of prayer, we need to be teaching our disciples because they need them all. And because they're not going to be disciples of Jesus if they haven't learned to pray. Nothing in our discipleship process could be more important than teaching our disciples to pray. He goes on to say this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. There is no, nothing better we could teach our disciples than to keep hope in their hearts. Now, when the, when, when the writer of Hebrews talks here about our hope, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, he is specifically talking about the hope of heaven. If you read through the book, he goes, oh, it's just over and over and over again. He's making reference to this about the joy, Jesus for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and, cross and scorned the shame and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus, Jesus made it through the Via Dolorosa and the cross because he had the hope of heaven in front of him. And we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Like Abraham, the great pilgrim, we are pressing on every day to get to the city whose builder and maker is God because we know from Scripture that God is going to dwell with us in heaven. We're going to live in the presence of God. That is the greatest hope that ought to be driving every Christian. And, you know, it's terrible. I haven't heard a sermon. When's the last time you heard a sermon on heaven? Like, what are we thinking about in our time? What are we thinking about when we're not infusing in our disciples 
a longing to be with Jesus, a longing to be with God. You, you run into these Christians that are afraid of death. Now, I understand that the, the, the survival mechanism is very strong in human beings. But Christians aren't supposed to be afraid of the fact that they're going to die. Amen. This is what our faith is for. I have some my, the dear, dear, dear brother and sister who discipled me, who made, made it possible for me to enter the ministry. They, 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 they mean so much to me. They were facing the death of their second daughter from cancer. They've lost, they're in their 80s. They've lost two of their daughters to cancer. This is brutal. Just brutal. You know, you're not supposed to lose your kids to cancer. You're not supposed to see your kids die before you. But as I was now pastoring them, they used to be my pastor, now me pastoring them, just reminding them, this is what our faith is for. They are, they, they are not dying. They are going ahead of us. They are going before you to heaven. And there's not a, not a way in the world that they're being cheated by the fact that they're dying young. They're going to be with Jesus. We need to keep the hope of heaven, to keep, keep the hope of our eternal destiny with God in front of us. We should not stop preaching the doctrine of heaven and of the Lord's return, but we definitely need to teach our disciples to keep that hope in front of them because um, Christian hope is always rooted in the return of Christ in the promise of eternal life in the presence of God. That's always the root of Christian hope. You know, it's, I was in Washington, D.C. the other day, and um, I was in an Uber, and I chose the Uber ride, the cheap Uber, right, so that they could pick up another passenger on the way to where they're taking you. It might take you a little longer to get there, but it's a lot cheaper. And so there in D.C., we pulled up, and this college student got in the car. And it was snowy, every, it was a very snowy day in Washington, D.C., and it was beautiful, snow everywhere. I just thought, I was rejoicing in the beauty of the snow and everything. She got in the car, and we're riding along, and the driver said something about the snow, and she said, the planet's going to, and then she said an ugly word. <laughs> the planet's going to blank. Um, and I thought, wow. Yeah, that's what she's being told every day. That's what she's being told every day. Um, you know, everybody likes to jump on Ocasio-Cortez right now, and I, I, I just caution you not to. Um, I caution you not to twist her words or deride her too much because she is the voice of a generation. Listen to what she's saying. She may be totally wrong. I think she's often totally wrong. But listen to her. She said the other day, everyone in my generation thinks we're going to be dead in 12 years. She didn't say, I believe that in 12 years all human life on the planet will cease. That's not what she said. Oh, she's being accused of saying that. That's not what she said. She said my generation thinks we're all going to be dead in 12 years. She's giving you a report. You ought to hear that. What is the secular eschatology of our time? The secular eschatology of our time is that we're killing the planet, that we've made permanent damage to it that can never be fixed, and we're all going to die. Guess what? We are. <laughs> They're right. We're all going to die. People need the hope of heaven. People need the hope of eternal life. Christians need the hope of eternal life in a world that's telling them that the world's going to pieces, it's going to nasty stuff, that, that there is Christian hope. There is no such thing as true Christianity that is not eschatological. If we, if we, have, if we have ripped the eschatology out of our faith, and we can't even preach on it anymore, we have allowed doctrinal controversy to destroy doctrine altogether. We need to preach hope. We need to preach Christian hope because this is a hopeless generation. So, somebody said to me the other day that C.S. Lewis said something like, uh, and I haven't been able to find the quote, but something like, the world has it all backwards. The world thinks um, that that nature is eternal and you're temporary. 
In fact, the opposite is true. You're eternal and nature's temporary. This world and the things of this world are going to come to an end. You are not. <laughs> and, you know, we need, we need to teach our disciples to live in hope. Because when people live in hope, they have a chance to make things better. People who have no hope do not work to make things better. People who have hope make things better. One of my favorite speeches I've ever heard in my life was Jesse Jackson in the 1984 Democratic Convention. Do you remember the speech? Do you remember what he said? His speech had this theme and it went over and over. He kept saying it over and over again. He kept saying, keep hope alive. <laughs> keep hope alive. And that refrain all the way through his speech, keep hope alive. Well, in a, in a world and in a generation where they, are, where they have lost their hope, where they think that the environmental situation is destroying the planet and we can't stop it. We need to keep hope alive. We need to be sharing hope with people because people who have hope will work to make a difference. <laughs> I love what, I love, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the ways we can keep hope alive is to keep preaching the truth. If we teach our students, if we teach our disciples to walk in the scriptures, they will walk in hope. I love what, uh, what Paul says in Romans. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. You know, I, I read the scriptures because they give me hope. I read them every day because I find hope in them. How many, I, I imagine that most of you read, the scripture, read through the scriptures every year. Three chapters a day gets you through the whole Bible every year. Most of you probably read the scriptures every year. I've been doing that for years, reading the scriptures through every year. Recently, when I turned 50, that was nine years ago. <laughs> Recently. Seems like just yesterday, doesn't it? I was 50 years old, and I realized that my father had died at age 68. And I thought, wow, maybe I've got 18 more times around the planet. And I thought, I have 18 more times to read the scriptures. And immediately, my heart sank. 18 more times to read David and Goliath? 18 more times to read the... The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 18 more times to read the creation story. 18 more times to read uh, the story of, uh, uh, of, of the prophet Isaiah. It, it's, uh, it, it got to me and I thought, well, I, maybe I could read twice a year. <laughs> they get twice as many trips to Scripture before I die because when I get to heaven, I'm not going to read anymore. I'm not going to read it anymore when I get there. It's, it's, I won't need it anymore. But um, so I started reading six chapters a day. It takes about 30 minutes. It takes six chapters a day. It takes about 30 minutes on average. And now I read the scriptures through twice. But I find that my hunger for them is so great that I get through the New Testament three times. So I finish, I finish about first of November. Then I have a whole month that I could zip through the New Testament in a month. And uh, I got to tell you, reading the scriptures, having a heavy diet of the scriptures, it keeps me full of hope. And there's nothing that we can do that will help our disciples better than to teach them to read the scriptures, not just give them, a, not just to build them a habit of everyday reading the scriptures, teach them to read them, teach them to understand the scriptures, teach them what the different parts of the Bible are and why they're there and how you read them. You know, you don't have to be some, you don't have to understand the, you know, heavy duty uh, hermeneutical theory and stuff. You just need to be able to understand the basics and read the Bible and feed yourself from it. What better could we do? But let me tell you, we're in a generation now that doesn't know what the Bible is. So they're going to great big churches where the Bible isn't preached. I heard recently a story of a young man that went to his pastor at a large church and he said to the pastor, I've noticed that you keep 
t making reference to some ancient book in your, in your talks. What is that? A <laughs> friend, friend of mine was telling me about uh, this, um, a, friend, a friend of mine, Dick Foth, he, he spoke to this um, executive that attends the church we taught. He said, what are you hearing when you come to church? And he said, well, it starts, it starts out with wah, 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 <laughs> and then it's wah, 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 <laughs> you know, like Charlie Brown's parents talking. And he essentially said, you know, I'm not understanding anything. We, we're, we have a generation here with an attention span of negative something. <laughs> we, we, you know, we just, we got to teach our kids. We got to teach our disciples. We got to teach new Christians to love the scriptures. Because if they love the scriptures, they're going to have hope. In, in, in John's gospel clearly preaches that the life of the ages to come, eternal life. You know, eternal life in Greek is the life of the ages. It's the life of the age to come. That eternal life begins not when Jesus returns and we're called to him. But eternal life begins the moment you come to faith in Christ. And the moment that you begin to live in Christ, uh, C.H. Dodd called it realized eschatology, that the life of the ages in the future begins in you now. We needn't fear that if we teach people about heaven and the hope of the return of Christ, that they won't be engaged with the world as they see it. What will happen is they'll engage the world with hope because eternal life will be breaking into the here and now. And as Jesse said, we've got to keep hope alive. We need to teach historic doctrines of God and morality because they're crucial if we're going to keep the hope of heaven alive. There is no true discipleship where the knowledge of God is not taught and where God's holiness is not honored. There's a lot of moral diversity in the world. And there are churches out there that have embraced the sexual revolution completely. Who, may, who maintain no prophetic critical distance between their teaching and the sexual revolution. Don't get me wrong. The, se the sexual revolution had some strong points. We, it taught us some good things. I'm not saying the sexual revolution was all bad. I'm just saying that churches need to keep a critical distance between themselves and the sexual revolution. And when churches don't keep that critical distance... God stops showing up. And when God stops showing up at church, people stop showing up. If we, don't, if we don't teach biblical doctrines of God, if we don't teach biblical doctrines of holiness, God will stop showing up at the church. If we don't teach our disciples solid Christian doctrine, if we don't teach them solid Christian morality, God's going to stop showing up in their life. It's not, um, it's, it's simply not Christian discipleship when we fail to give our disciples a doctrinal structure. Now, I don't care if you are Lutheran or Anglican or Baptist or assemblies of God, or whatever tradition you come from, but would you teach it to your disciples? Would you give them a doctrinal framework that they can think about God through? Because any of your doctrines would be better than none. <laughs> Wouldn't they? I mean, we, are, we, we, have, we have come into a time in which doctrine... Is, is, is a dirty word. Because love unites and doctrine divides. <clears throat> really? I mean, it's just, we've got to teach our disciples the content of the Christian faith. And it's right there in Scripture. And it's plain to see. 
we need to not make this too complicated. <laughs> and uh, God doesn't change. Well, finally, the author of Hebrews goes on, and I've lost my timing, so I'm going to finish fast. Um, he goes on to say, and let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. I said there were three, maybe four things that this passage teaches. The first one was prayer. second one was teaching hope. The third one is teaching love and good deeds. Now, he says here, let us consider how many ways we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. Before I talk about what that means, I just want to talk about Jesus. In John, the book, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, it says this about Jesus, that he knew his disciples personally. He said in verse uh, 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I love that. I especially note, I love this, that it says, Jesus, Jesus said, I know them and they follow me. Jesus loved his disciples deeply. He didn't just know them. He loved them deeply. In chapter 13, verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then Jesus led his disciples in works of love. The passage continues. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And so you see that Jesus knew his disciples, he loved his disciples, and he led them in works of love. Now, back to our passage. Let us consider one another so that we may... Let us consider how we may spur one another on to, toward love and good deeds. Now, Look, I studied six years of Greek in co college and seminary to tell you this. Would you please listen? I, <laughs> six years. <laughs> That's not what the passage says. That is a meatball translation of this passage. And most of them are meatball translations because it's just so hard to translate. The, the Greek here is just so different from English that it's really hard to translate. But I'm going to walk you through it, and you're going to know what it says. You ready? It says, katanoomen. <laughs> katanoomen is from the verb katanoeo, and it means consider. Just like it was translated, consider. It means consider in this sense. Kata is an intensifier. Not, noeo is to know or think about something. Katanoeo is to deeply consider, to deeply consider, to know something deeply. Now, what is the object of the verb? The object of the verb is alelus. Everybody that's ever had first year Greek knows that alelus means, and frankly, most people who's ever been to an evangelical church know that alelus means one another. What are we supposed to consider? One another. Consider one another. That's what the passage says. It gets more complicated in a second, but, that, but, but the translation doesn't get that across. It says consider how to spur one another, right? Now that's very different. I'm going to consider how I can spur you on. I'm thinking about an idea, right? But what if I considered you? What if I considered... Chris Milheisler. What if I considered him? That's different, isn't it? I could sit there and think about how to stimulate him, you know, to love and good works all day long, and I still wouldn't know him. But if I considered Chris Milheisler, I'd, I would get to know him. I'd find out who he is. If I spent enough time with Chris Milheisler, and if I, and if I really got to know him, I'd see that under all of his faults, he is a precious human being made in the image of God. Because he's a Christian brother, if I really consider Chris, I'm going to see Jesus in him. 
What do you think it's going to do in my heart if I see Jesus in Chris? How am I going to feel about Chris? I'm going to love Chris. Because I love Jesus and I love him and everybody I've ever seen him in. Consider one another, it says. And then the verb ace, un, uh, the verb, the word ace, it's a preposition, ace, it means unto. And then the next word is paroxysmon. Do you know what a paroxysm is? He had a paroxysm. It's a fit. A, a paroxysm is what, what you have if you suffer from epilepsy. An, an, an epileptic fit, that's a paroxysm. A paroxysm is a violent tremor. It's a violent spasm. It's a fit. Now, in all of Greek literature, every single use of paroxysm is a bad thing. Outside the book of Hebrews, and the book of Hebrews knows Greek better than anybody in the New Testament. But in all of Greek literature, a paroxysm is always a bad thing. It's either a physical fit that you have because of epilepsy or a, or, or a fever or something, or it's a fit, a figurative fit, a fit of rage, a fit of revenge. It's never a good thing. The author of Hebrews says, let us consider one another unto a paroxysm, not of rage or revenge or, 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 or disease, a paroxysm of love and good works. He suggests here that there is a knowledge of each other that we could get to. That if we got to that level of knowledge of each other, it would provoke in us a veritable fit of love and good works. Not a fit of rage like the world lives in, but a fit of love and good works. That's the craziest thing you ever heard of. Who ever heard of that? But isn't that exactly the kind of community you want to live in? Isn't that exactly the kind of church you want to belong to? Where people know each other, when people have considered one another, when they've seen the, the person of Christ in each other, and they're, they are so impressed with each other that it produces in that community a veritable fit of love and good works. I had a neighbor when I was in seminary, I lived straight across the street with a big family, a mother, a father, and a daughter, just three of them. But they, they, were, they weren't big in, in number, they were big in size of arguments. I mean, they would fight like cats and dogs and, and they'd stand out on the stoop of the house and the daughter and the, the father would yell at each other and, and then just have a fit. It was one of the most intense things I had ever seen. And it was, it was during that time that I read this verse in Greek for the first time, and I thought, wow. Can you imagine love and good works as intense as that family feud? Um, he, the author of Hebrews is suggesting here that we ought to consider one another to the point that it creates a love in us that spills over into good works. Um, you know, the thing is, there are no good works we can do that have any spiritual value at all except works of love. It doesn't do us a bit of good to do good works if what we really want is brownie points doesn't do us a bit of spiritual good to do good works if we're just trying to appease God. It doesn't do any good. It's not even Christian. The only kind of good works that matter are the ones that are born out of love. I mentioned that couple that were my pastors years ago that have lost their daughters. What was amazing about Jesse as a pastor and Kay as a pastor's uh, uh, the female pastor... <laughs> was that they, they loved people. You couldn't be in their presence very long without realizing that they loved you. And it changed people's lives to be loved that way. Um, we will make disciples, we will make the best disciples when we know them enough to love them fully. 
Like Jesus knew his disciples and he loved them to the full. He loved them to the end and then taught them to love one another. That's what Christian discipleship looks like. That's what it's supposed to look like. When you do it that way, you're doing it the Jesus, the Jesus way. He goes on to say, not giving up the habit of meeting together, as some are, not, not giving up on meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day approaching. Once again, we're back to eschatological hope, aren't we? But continuing to meet together, and Gus, we've got a problem in our churches today. It used to be that good Christians came to church every Sunday. You remember? Now, good church, good Christians, committed Christians go to church once a month. I'm hearing it all over the country. People aren't going to church anymore. This is a serious problem. <laughs> we, 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 we must instill in our disciples a love for the body of Christ, a love for the gathering of Christians. You know, when I was a child, we, we, uh, we were in revival. And it was, uh, I remember 1972, we had a Jesus People March downtown in Florence, Alabama, and I dressed up like a hippie and joined the march. And uh, we all dressed up like hippies. It was great because we were so proud of the hippies because they were coming to Jesus. <laughs> our, our whole church was full of ex-hippies. Well, they were still hippies, but <laughs> they were Jesus freaks, you know. And we were in revival, and, and we went to church every night because there was something going on there. There was something good going on. And uh, we were there virtually every night of the week. Monday nights, there was no church. Every other day, there was something going on at church, and we got there. I'm going to suggest that we cannot disciple people effectively on a one, once a month basis. You know, we, we need to be together. We need to be together. And there just is no substitute for actually spending time with people and teaching them Christian faith. Uh, you know, love that book, Great Expectations. My time is up, I have to stop. That book, Great Expectations by um, Charles Dickens. Uh, Pip's uh, sister says that she raised him by hand. <laughs> she raised him by hand and she meant, <laughs> my wife has always used that phrase that she raised our kids by hand. She didn't mean that she spanked them, but, but it, was, uh, you know, it was an artisan raising that they got. <laughs> it, was by, it was all done by hand. I mean, it was, it was done by intense fellowship. It was done by being together. There's, there is no sub, I mean, all the, quality, all the quality time in the world uh, <clears throat> doesn't make up for not being there. <laughs> um, my wife has raised our daughters by hand. I've tried to raise them by hand. Tried to raise them by the nightly Bible story, by the nightly time of prayer by the talking about the things of the Lord uh, with them on a regular basis. Um, we really need to not give up this discipleship by hand. If we do it this way, we'll do it the way Jesus did it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this incredible group today, the precious brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I've lo learned to love them as I've spoken to them, as I've watched their responses to the word of God and to my attempts to, my attempt to deliver it. Thank you for these people. Thank you for each one of them. God, I pray that you would make us disciple makers of deep conscience. Lord, that we would raise up a new generation of Christians who are raised the old fashioned way, the way Jesus did it. Lord, would you pour out your Holy Spirit on our efforts? Lord, we are like dry ground that has been sown but is waiting for the rain. We need your Holy Spirit to, to smile on our efforts, to, to germinate our efforts, to fall on us afresh. God, move through your church across the Puget Sound region and around the country. Pour out your Spirit on us. Give us a new love for Jesus. Give us that first love again, Lord. I pray that you'd move in our churches so that people would, that would once again be hungry for times of prayer together. They'd once again be hungry for the teaching of the Scriptures that once a week would not be good enough for them, that they would seek you out, Lord, they would seek out your people, that we would have opportunity to be together and teach one another and, and learn of one another, Lord, and to see Jesus 
in one another. That we may see the full expression of New Testament Christianity at work in every neighborhood. Transforming, renewing love and power in our, in our midst, Lord Jesus. As we teach our disciples to pray and to hope, to consider others, to break out in works of love. to pour, Lord, please pour out your spirit on this effort. And help us not just to do discipleship, but to truly make disciples in the way Jesus has taught us. And we glorify you in all of this. We, 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 we recognize straightforwardly that we can't do any good thing without you. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us not to work out of our own selves, but anoint our efforts so that these poor human efforts bring about divine, eternal results. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You've been so kind. God bless you.